Hello, I'm Marty Hurtman, the director of Mary's Place. Thank you for helping us ensure that no child sleeps outside in our community. You can donate via YouTube to help us keep more families safely in their own homes. I'm so excited to have Matt Berniner here with us today. Stick around after the performance for an exclusive interview with Matt and Cheryl Waters. I think once these, is that better? Yeah. Okay, we're good. Okay. And you guys all ready? Standing by. In action. Hi there. Come on up. I'm Matt Berninger. Welcome to my KEXP, uh, KEXP home session. Start it over. <laughs> Keep rolling. Standing by. <clears throat> Let me get focus again. Okay. Ready? Yep. And action. Okay, hello there. Come on up. Hello there. I'm Matt Berninger. Come to my K KEXP home session. Um, I have Harry Whitford, Ron Boy, also known as Julia, uh, Julia Laws, and Sean O'Brien. Uh, thanks, KEXP, for having us. Uh, and also Starbucks for sponsoring this. This is for um, Mary's Place, which is um, an institution in Seattle that, that uh, helps out the unhoused people. So uh, thanks for having us do this. We are going to start with a song I wrote with Walter Martin. This is called Distant Axis. came back to me around a distant axis I didn't even hear the door I was looking up at the levels in between us As I was sinking through the floor if only you, if only you would come around the distant axis I would do whatever you wanted me to If only you, if only you would come around the distant axis I feel like I'm as far as I can get from you I'm getting pulled away around the distant axis I guess I'll have to wait and see There's a pattern to the way the world is tearing up I think it's happening to me If only you The distant axis. I would do whatever you wanted me to. If only you, if only you would come around the distant axis. I feel like I'm as far as I can get from you. Like I'm as 
far as I can get from you I feel like I'm as far as I can get from you This uh, is called Take Me Out of Town. I think I'll move over here. I'm gonna move over here, Tom. My brother Tom is filming. Um, thank you, Tom. I'm gonna do some pole work on this one. <clears throat> You'd be here by now You said you'd be here Any minute Swear to God I've never been so burned out Gonna lose it Any minute Wake me Take me out of town To the end of any road you wanna go down Make me Make me listen all the way To the end of any road Yes, I know Everyone's in this alone We gotta leave here Any minute Swear to God, is this how you thought it turned out? You're gonna lose me any minute. Wake me, take me out of town to the end of any road that you wanna go down. Make me. Make me listen all the way To the end of any road Cause I don't know how to be here without you I don't know how to go on I don't know how to be here without you I don't know how to go on Said you'd be here any minute. I swear to God, I've never been so burned out. I'm gonna lose it any minute. Wait me, take me out of town to the end of any road. You wanna go down Make me Make me listen all the way To the end of any road Because I don't know how to be here without you I don't know how to go on Don't know how to be here without you. I don't know how to go on. That was Take Me Out of Town. I wrote that with Hayden Desser. 
Uh, okay. What are we doing? Now we're going to do a song, another song I wrote um, with these guys. Oh, yeah, let's do, we're doing Silver Springs now. Um, so, yeah, Harry uh, and Sean wrote this with, with these guys. Um, it's a, a duet. Today we'll be featuring Ron Boy, Julia Laws. Um, are you ready to be featured? <clears throat> this was written um, sort of about uh, Silver Springs, Florida, where my parents some, would go on vacation. Um, but it's mostly a town or a song about small towns and and um, or whatever, leaving town and uh, shedding skin and becoming something new. So sort of a bit about that. I don't know. Okay. Forget about what I said I want to meet you somewhere right now On a glass bottom boat I want you to take me out I want to burn down a house I want you to kill my time I want to meet you somewhere right now In the dandelions Don't talk don't cry, don't try so hard Don't suck, don't die Get out, run far from home They'll never understand you anyway In Silver Spring Everyone knows where to hang, but they never show you the ropes You'll get hit by a car, shot by a cousin, or slip off a boat One of these days the sky's gonna rain, so why are you crying? I wanna meet you somewhere right now, in the dandelions Sit down Drive slow all night Be quiet, throw up Get out, go far from home I'll never understand you anyway In Silver Springs They'll never understand you anyway in Silver Springs
This is the title track of the my record, Serpentine Prison. Um, here we go. Don't look at those. Someday I'll memorize the words to these. Okay. Again, this was uh, I wrote this with Sean O'Brien and Harry Whitford. Over the course of many, many years. Actually, it was in one afternoon. Uh, go ahead. I see the starlight through the clouds Why won't anybody listen to me? Don't make me say it again out loud Big star are doing don't worry baby bipolar pride swimming the tide keep your dead head above and your chin up you're gonna have a pretty hard time without drugs without love total submission i've seen a vision everyone's screaming i've been daydreaming Sorry I'm fishing without permission Tell her I'm missing in a serpentine prison Don't try to connect the dots anymore Let them go, they're gonna do it on their own Tell me that I'm not in this alone Am I? I'm so sorry I don't know I'm slow I feel like an impersonation of you Or am I doing another version of you doing me? Nobody's ever really thinking about us Half as much as we want them to be Total frustration, deterioration Nationalism, another moon mission Total submission, I've seen a vision Call electrician, serpentine prison Whatever it is, I try not to listen Cold cynicism, a blind nihilism I need a vacation from intoxication Tell her I'm missing In a serpentine prison I've been picking my kid up from school Smelling like Girl Scout cookies and drool I still crawl up to you every night Do not forgive me, I'm a reptile You say I'm a lot I'm hard to take I think you're just Drinking the water I walk into walls And I lay awake I don't want to give it to my daughter Total submission I've seen a vision Everyone's screaming I've been daydreaming Sorry I'm fishing without permission Tell her I'm missing in a serpentine prison Total frustration, deterioration Nationalism, another moon mission Total submission, I've seen a vision Call electrician, serpentine prison Whatever it is, I try not to listen Cold cynicism, a blind nihilism I need a vacation from intoxication Tell her I'm missing in a serpentine prison Total submission, I've seen a vision Everyone's screaming, I've been daydreaming Sorry I'm fishing Without permission 
tell her I'm missing in a serpentine prison. Okay. Uh, this is called Then You Can Tell Me Goodbye, by, uh, written by John D. Loudermilk uh, hundreds and hundreds of years ago. Actually, I'm not sure. Um, but the version I fell in love with was recorded, I think, in the 70s by Betty Swan, or in the 60s by Betty Swan. Uh, here it goes. Kiss me each morning for a million years. Hold me each evening by your side. Tell me you love me for a million, a million years. Then if it don't work out. Then if it don't work out Then you can tell me goodbye Sweeten my coffee with a morning kiss Soften my dreams with your sigh after you've loved me for a million years Then if it don't work out Then if it don't work out Then you can tell me goodbye If you must go home, baby I won't grieve, but just wait a lifetime before you leave. Please. Then if you must go, I won't tell you no. Just so that we can say we tried. Tell me you love me for a million, million years. And then if it don't work out, then if it don't work out, then you can tell me goodbye. Then if it don't work out, then if it don't work out Then you can tell me Goodbye Thank you again, KEXP And Mary's Place And Starbucks And Seattle And Radio And you guys, thanks Matt Thank you so much for being with us here today. It is always such a pleasure to talk to you. Uh, thanks, Cheryl. Yeah, likewise. What an incredible performance that one, that what just was. And, you know, when I think of you, Matt, I think of someone who has a joie de vivre, a lust for life, as you can say. And you seem to genuinely love connecting with people. I remember when you were on tour with El Vi, you posted these daily videos on Instagram and they were so fun. And I feel like they gave an insight into your sweet and goofy personality. You can see some of that on stage when you're performing, but it feels like another side of you, one that might surprise people. And what came out, I watched those day after day after day on the tour and you just seem to have a sheer delight for meeting new people, working with new people, it is absolutely palpable when you get a glimpse inside of your personality. And a lot of that comes out on social media. You really genuinely seem to enjoy that uh, form of interacting with the people. Has that been a great way for you to connect with fans? It's funny. I, um, um, 
I do. I, I do think um, I have enjoyed like d- doing a lot of the the social media stuff. I, I admit I do like Instagram, and I do like. Um, I kind of like doing interviews. I kind of like this. It's um, um, and I do really like collaborating and, and being in a studio and working with people. Um, I do like. I like. I, I like my old office job, which was a team of people. I do like working with on a team. I like. Um, but then there, there's, there, it's, it's the other, there is a big part of my personality, which it, it kind of goes in extremes where it's, where it's, you know, I do that like on tour and that's, there's so much of that. And then after tour, after shows or after the history, like I do go off and I do like to be alone um, a lot too. And, 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 and it, so it's, I think it's everybody. It's, I think, I think, um, yeah, that is a big part of my personality. It maybe doesn't come across like in the performance on the stage, um, but even that's also a performance, you know, <laughs> a little bit. The, the the happy-go-lucky goofball is also a, a version is like a version of a performance, you know. One yeah. thing that seems um, pretty evident is that you are constantly on the move. You seem sort of like the Energizer Bunny, always thinking about something always working on something um is that or do you feel like you're just constantly um if not your body in motion your mind in motion Mm -hmm. yeah um yeah i've been um trying to 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 counter that i've been trying to uh slow that yeah i i I mean i think most people are always a buzz with with ideas and anxieties and all that kind of stuff. And, 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 um, and I have, I have found the only way to sort of like get, is just to attack it is to lean in and just go right at it, whatever it is. And so, so that has always been, it, it has, I think I get that from my dad. My dad can't sit still and, and, um, it, you know, it just needs a project, uh, needs to feel like he's making a scratch on the universe somehow, you know, at, at every moment. And, and, um, and he gets really depressed when he's not doing stuff. And I, and I think I have that, uh, uh, gift slash affliction, you know, um, because it's, um, I do, I do wish I could spend a lot more time doing nothing and enjoying that. Um, and, uh, but yeah, no, I, but, but the, the thing that always makes me feel good is when I feel like I, well, I made something, I made something out of nothing. You know, I did, I did something or it doesn't have to be like a project and just like taking a long walk. If I don't, if a day goes by or a week goes by and I haven't taken a long walk, I feel there's, I feel pent up and stressed and stuff. So I think that's, everybody's got to, you know, I think people do, do people exercise, people, people have their routines and have their habits and watch sports and do all that stuff to try to maybe to, to slow down or to, to, to unplug or to, to rethink or just to turn the noise down a little bit. So um, art has been a way for me to turn the noise down, but then it also gets really noisy, you know, making art all the time or something. Was art a big part of your childhood? I know your brother's an artist as well. And I know you have a sister. I don't know what she does. But was that something, art and music, around when you were a kid? Yeah. I mean, not a ton of music. I always say, I've been saying, like, my parents had, like, 25 records, it feels like, the whole time I was a child. But my mom's a painter. My dad um, was all is, 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 a, is an artist, is always, like, drawing in the woods, drawing um, – you know, I think of him a little bit as like John Muir, like, you know, but he's always like drawing lichen and, 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 and blackberry bushes and, 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 um, and always like sending, you know, love songs and, and poems to my mom and on, on anniversaries and birthdays. And, and so, and he's also, you know, a sculptor, but he's also a lawyer. And, 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 um, so, yeah, they've, they were always doing stuff like just, I mean, whether it's stuff in the backyard, you know, my dad's garden was an art project, you know, as it was, a uh, my dad moved a Creek like 200 yards or 300 yards from like a big Creek just to save a tree. And it took him five years and he just, you know, yeah, it's, it's, it doesn't always have to be like uh, high art sometimes moving a Creek. That sounds like a labor of love. Yeah. And it's a, but it's also art. You know, it's, it's like, it's like you're making a scratch on the universe. He saved a tree, you know, by moving a Creek. It was uh, worthwhile, you know? Well, you made a beautiful piece of art uh, this year, or you released in October, Serpentine Prison. 
I fall more in love with that record every time I listen to it. It is filled with so much beauty and there's so much buried in there. Every time I listen to the record, I feel like I hear something I didn't hear the previous time. And I have to imagine that your first solo record had to have been pretty darn exciting. I just mentioned A Labor of Love, perhaps. Um, I'd say it'd be an understatement to say you've kept yourself pretty busy over the past couple of decades, not only with the National and L vibe, but you know, numerous, innumerable other projects that have kept you busy. And I'm wondering why now was the right time to release this record, your first solo record? Um, um, it probably wasn't the right time. Um, I mean, I probably, I probably should have done a solo record 10 years ago, but I never, I never needed one to, um, and I still don't actually feel like I needed to. It, it, it started because I started, I wanted to make a covers record and I, and I got to know Booker T. Jones and I, and he made, um, he produced and arranged Stardust, which is one of my favorite covers records. And then, it, then I just wanted to be in the studio with him. And then by sharing some some originals, he was like, "Let's let's focus more on originals." And so it turned into a group of originals, which then, uh, you know, I guess became a solo album it, um, because otherwise it'd be called like Matt Burninger and Friends, um, and that's just a dumb title. Um, but so it it happened real organically. It kind of that's how it how it happened. Um, once I realized like, oh, this is a solo album, I got really excited about that. That was, that was like, oh, that feel, this feels like I should do this. Um, and then there was part of me was like, oh, I should have done this a long time ago. Not meaning like, like, uh, leave anything else, but just, it was, it was, I learned a lot by, by, you know, doing this in a, doing something in a very different way. I learned a lot every time I would collaborate with anybody, but this was so specifically like pulling in so many people from all the, all my other bands and all my other experiences and old friends and new friends doing it really fast, doing it live, doing it in two weeks. All of that was a new, was new for me. And so that was a big learning experience. Um, yeah, most, most of the time I'm just trying to like, learn i'm just trying to like break the mold of of where i'm in, in break the mold i'm in and and see if i can expand what, what i'm trying to what i'm doing and have and that's that's when i'm having the most fun so um um yeah but, but it wasn't like a long-term plan to like go solo i'm, I'm like i don't want to go solo i did but i do like making records in different ways well, one of the good reasons for waiting so long or the side benefits is all the people that you've met in all of those years. Yeah. And, you know, the name, it is a Matt Berninger record, but you have invited many of your friends and people that you've met over the years. And talk about some of the people who worked on this record with you. Booker, of course. Um, yeah. What an incredible experience it must have been to work with that legend. Yeah, Booker T was sort of the eye of the storm, but um, but the the storm was made up of of like about you know twelve or fifteen people, um, like Mike Brewer and Scott Devendorf. Scott's in the National. Mike Brewer, w it, the two of them were in my first band, Nancy. Um, Hayden Desser is somebody I've written with and been friends with forever, and Walter Martin and, and Matt Barrick from the Walkman are just old friends. Harrison Whitford I met recently um, and, and wrote some songs with him. Sean O'Brien, who's been my engineer out here since I moved to LA about seven or eight years ago, he's been sort of kind of my musical director. Um, and, 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 and Brent Knopf, who's from Elva, I wrote with him. I, I, um, Andrew Bird is a friend out here who brought in so much Gail and Dorsey, who I worked with at the national. And it was, it, uh, I'm, I'm forgetting people, Kyle and Ben from, from playing brass. Um, they're all from the national in Beirut and Matt Sheehy is, a, is, was in Elva and lost. So these are, yeah, it just keeps going on and on. Yeah. Gail's in there too, of course. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, Mickey Raphael plays on Stardust plays all the harmonica on Stardust and innumerable classic albums. And he came in and does all the harmonica. Um, um, yeah, it was a, um, a cavalcade of geniuses um, with Booker at the center. Yeah. Uh, you made, you just played the song Serpentine Prison from the record. And I know you made a video of that, which uh, I'm thinking was recorded before the pandemic. In fact, I know it is. That's when I saw it. And it was so fun to see all of those people many of the ones you just named, lots of familiar faces and a lot of people that you care about. And I know you'd love to be touring on this record right now. Mm -hmm. And you've said that 
full body anticipation that comes right before a live show is one of the things that you miss the most about performing. And I'm wondering how you're sort of getting that out of your system right now. You're doing a lot of the social media stuff right now, but there's nothing quite like performing live. Although I did just see you do a Tonight Show performance uh, Mm -hmm. last night of a Velvet Underground cover. So Mm -hmm. you're getting to do a bit of that. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I really miss that thrill. I really miss that walking out on stage and, and seeing all these people that are just so excited to see me, you know, to see the band, to see, to hear these songs and to, and, 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 and I do miss, I, I, I it's a, when, when you, when you get that for, 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 you know, 15 years, like, you know, um, all the time, I mean, um, you get used to that. And when it's, when that goes away, you, you, you do, it's a strange uh, free fall. Um, but then again, doing that every night really turns you into a weird person, really, really makes you expect it, makes you need it. And that's not a good thing to expect and need all these people to need you that much or want you that much. And so you, it starts to become a thing. You, you feed your ego feeds them and they feed your ego and, and everything gets, and then you, every, every, after a while, I think that's why pref- people on the road can go insane. And, 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 um, that, that is, um, that's been a, it's nice to get some perspective on all that, you know, just get some perspective on my, my personality, you know, and how, how performing and, and, and being that role of that front man does twist your personality a little bit. And, um, so being home is, uh, I'm, I'm re recalibrating my personality, which isn't necessarily any better, <laughs> you know, it's not any better, but it's, it's nice to know, get to know the other sides of it a little better. Yeah. How has this time at home been for you and your family? And I know you're close to your family. You have a uh, family here in Seattle, I know. Yeah. or And uh, I imagine it's been a while since you've seen many of the people that you love, at least face to face. What's this time been like for you? Uh, the, with regard to, to like my parents and my sister, Rachel and her family and, and my nieces and everybody who lives uh, in Seattle, um, and the people, yeah, it is, it is, that's the way I was like, I haven't seen, I have not seen my parents in, in, oh, I don't know, you know, it's like since, since before th- this happened and, and, and like so many kids are, haven't seen their grandparents and so many, but I've also had, had some connections and, and, and conversations with my sister and my parents that I had, I hadn't, I hadn't had before. Um, and just connecting in on a on a more genuine no bullshit level with even even your your siblings uh, uh, be, who you haven't seen like like you take people for granted you take your parents for granted you take your your your, your I take my sister for granted I take my brother for granted my brother I'm, I'm in I see my brother every day so I'm, I um, <laughs> we need to take each other for granted it's just to survive um, but yeah that so in a in a funny way there's been a real disconnect from, from the world, but then in some, some specific instances, some real reconnection. Like I've, I've, um, yeah, I've reconnected with my parents in a funny way, um, without even seeing them. Um, just because you realize you, how much you take for granted when it all goes away. Yeah. That sounds so comforting. Your record actually is very comforting. I remember the first time, I listened to it just starting right off with my eyes or t-shirts. It just felt like a warm hug. And I'm wondering, were you trying to create a specific atmosphere or sounds for this record? And if so, where'd you look for inspiration for that? I mean, um, the songs, I, I, you know, the, the songs I, I didn't really think so much about this. This is a collection of songs that have these themes. I can kind of see them now. Um, and and they're not always like optimistic, happy themes, but I but but I, I I've always found myself most comforted by um by 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 art that is showing me something that's real and and uh, whether it's comfortable or not, and I've always and so 
that 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 that's the thing about what the songs are about. But in terms of its sonic vibe and stuff, Willie Nelson's covers album Stardust was 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 a model in some ways of like, in in Booker and Sean O'Brien who engineered and, and co-produced a lot of it was we, we talked about that record a lot. Um, and its atmosphere and how you can kind of hear like I, I I you can hear 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 the breath you can hear the cologne you can you can sense the the sweat you can you can the chairs creak but you can hear people look at each other you know and and um i i just wanted to to get that and it and it wasn't that complicated it's just it's just a matter of like making a room um and getting people who play sensitive are, are sensitive players to each other and you just get everybody in the room together playing and you can Booker led that. Booker was sort of this sort of, you know, uh, shepherd of vibe, um, and 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 um, knew when not knew when to stop, knew when to not add anymore, and also knew when to, that it when something needed more. Um, but it was a it was definitely an exercise in 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 minimalism, at least in terms of like don't overdress th- this these songs and and. Um, yeah. So, 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 so in that way, uh, um, I was Willie Nelson Sardos has always felt like just sonically every time I hear it. And a lot of that's my connection because it was my dad's favorite record. I heard it as a kid and I felt safe as a kid and I was a ha- relatively happy kid. And I hear that record and I'm like, oh, I feel, I feel good. I feel good about, I feel like I have my life ahead of me. You know, it just comes back to me. Um, so I wanted the record just to, just to at least be, be um, sensitive. You know, I don't know. Well, you definitely, to, yeah, you, yeah. you definitely accomplished that because it's interesting that you started with the idea in mind to create a covers record that made you feel the way this particular Lily Nelson record Stardust made you feel. And you ended up with an album full of originals that make you feel that way as well. And you pulled different people in to help you write each of those. Were those songs that you are, had already had or did you... So, a couple of them, I I were kind of I'd already written almost all of it. Uh, like Distant Axis, um, was was one of the first ones that I wrote with Walter Martin, and one of the first ones that I let Booker hear, and and um, and that was that was that one was kind of the most cooked of of all the ones that I took in. The, uh, some of them were were barely cooked. Um, some of them we we I wrote in the process of working with Booker and, and the, these people and, and wrote them, you know, really quick um, while we were in the studio um, or at least just, um, so it was a little bit of combination of, of old and new things that I, that were some things that I just didn't know where else to, I loved and wanted to t- finish and take further. And, and then the process inspired some newer songs like Serpentine Prison and, and, um, uh, Silver Springs, and those were actually kind of um, some of the lyrics had been sitting around, but the song itself happened really quick with like Harry and Sean, and um, yeah, so uh, it was a bit of a combo. Well, we appreciate you recording some of those songs for us. You did Serpentine Prison and Silver Spring. I also mm-hmm. love the song on the album One More Second, and you made a video of that song. It's super fun to watch you dancing. Of course, I have seen you do that many, many times live in concert. But have you always loved to dance? But- yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I was always a even as a you know those kids at the weddings when you're a little t- the kids that like that just you get to dance. And I think maybe that happened to me. I like my parents got me dancing, and everybody cheered for me, and I just like oh dancing. <laughs> <laughs> that's something that I do well, you know, as, as a, probably as a toddler. And then, and then, and I don't do it well, but I enjoy it. And I think that's what dancing is about. If you just like move your body and, and enjoy the way it feels, then you're dancing. And, and so throughout high school, I'd, I'd go to, I'd, I'd get invited to a lot of dances cause I was a decent dancer and I was, I was a decent person. And, um, and then I, I really danced a lot on the, this, this riverboat in Cincinnati um, every Sunday night, 97X, which was W-O-X-Y, which was my beloved like local college station out of, of Oxford, Ohio, would do a night on, on a riverboat for, you know, for like four hours. You would go up down the Ohio River and listening to Joy Division and, and ministry and, and, and um, you know, whatever uh it was rem and 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 the cure and and um 
and I, in, you know, I, I, since we were on a river, apparently, um, they didn't care if I was 21 and, I, and so, <laughs> you know, I would, I would go with my sister and I, as a, as a, as a, a 17 year old and, and get to drink beer and dance with high school, you know, girls older than me on a riverboat. Um, yeah, that was, what's, what's not to love about that. Yeah. Yeah. There was also a, a club that had a one night a week had a place. It was called, the club was called Cooters. Um, and it was normally just a cheesy sports bar, but one night a week they had a thing called beat club and it was all the goths and all the, like from, from, from downtown Cincinnati would come from every, every nook and cranny of Cincinnati. Same, same crowds. I would say at beat club and, and this riverboat thing. It was, there was an underground, every city's got a little bit of an underground goth dance thing you know did you ever go through a goth phase not professionally um <laughs> yeah you never there dressed up like that. robert smith i did shave the whole back of my head once and just kept like th this thing and, and coming over down because a bunch of the skater guys in high school i thought just looked so cool and they were all just like but i couldn't skate um i had stupid clothes i was wearing khaki pants and like a you know like a garanimal shirt or something and i <laughs> i shaved the back of my head i just looked like a like a barber accident you know an accident at the barber um not I didn't look like a skater. Um, and, but that was the closest I think I ever got the goth. I delivered pizzas and I remember delivering pizzas to a guy who I'd see on the riverboat who always had a human arm bone around and he had a black hair and, and, you know, just total, just only wore black and black eyeliner. And he had a human arm bone always around his neck. And one day I, I worked for a place called Trotta's pizzas and I delivered a pizza and all of a sudden that dude answered the door, but he wasn't, he was all, he was all in his straight attire or whatever his, his normal. <laughs> Attire. You're like, where's your harm bone? Yeah, yeah. He was dressed <laughs> for school, and and, he, and we recognize each other, and 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 uh, we we're like, never speak of it, never speak of our goth, um, you know, nights on the boat. <laughs> it's funny. It was, it was that was Cincinnati is like, you know, it's like one of those conservative towns where um, to be progressive, you kind of have to do it in the shadows, you know. Well, speaking about home um, and so many memories you have of home, this performance that you did, and we thank you so much, is part of And to All a Good Home. And it's a week-long series benefiting local Seattle organization Mary's Place and their No Child Sleeps Outside campaign. And Mary's Place has helped women and families move out, move out of homelessness into stable situations. And you've spoken beautifully about the importance of your childhood home in Cincinnati. And it's great to hear you telling these stories about that. Why is a physical, you know, for the outside the obvious reasons, why is a physical home so important? Oh God! I mean, it seems like a basic, you know, health just just health care, like 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 healthy food, um, shelter, heat. Um, seems like we should be able to provide that for everybody, and um, especially in this country. And 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 it's it's. I, 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 you know, um, yes, of course, uh, the, the problem of people losing their houses or their homes or their jobs, um, um, sometimes people fall through the cracks for, for, for medical reasons, for addiction reasons, for, 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 for mental health reasons. And all those reasons are, are, uh, are, uh, we need to, we need to, to think of those like there's, for example, there's, there's a, there's a woman, there, I live in Venice, California, and there's a lot of unhoused people. And, and my next door neighbor um, is a very old man and, 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 you know, hardly answers the door. And, and sometimes there was a, there was an unhoused woman who's clearly, um, I, I don't, I, I, I wouldn't diagnose schizophrenia, but it seemed like schizophrenia who was, who was trying to get into his house and, and, and as neighbors sort of protecting this older man, we had to step in and try to get this woman and not to go get into his house but she was it was like talking to a child and she had the mind of a child who she just needed probably to use the bathroom somewhere right and she didn't know what was happening and everyone was and this is during covid and everyone was freaked out and in danger and um it was just one of the saddest things right and so i see i see people with mental illness and or even drug addiction and i do I, you know it's like if we saw someone with a broken limb um or a child with a, with a with a broken limb we would stop and help them right um maybe it was their fault they broke their limb we would still stop and help them 
and I think we, we, we've been conditioned to, to, to not see the, the unhoused and the suffering around us and make excuses for it. And we can't. I don't think we should and we can't really. I don't think there's an excuse for it. Yeah, supporting Mary's Place and other organizations like it even more critical this year as unsheltered families in our region are facing even greater levels of uncertainty and fear, as you mentioned, due to the COVID-19 pandemic. And we appreciate you know, artists and so many others who are helping them, you know, push forward these missions to reach out and provide support to these people. So thank you so much for doing this today. Yeah, my and, pleasure. you know, I know that you're a big fan of making playlists. Uh, it made me laugh recently when you talked in an interview about how Spotify knows you better than anyone else. What about that curation is so pleasing to you? I mean, I imagine it's something you've done your whole life. Making playlists? Yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, um, I, I do think songs have, have, have always been, um, have always been the things that I've heard the most truth in, you know? I mean, like, uh, I, I, I read novels and I, you know, I went to Catholic school and I'm the Bible. I there's a lot of good stuff in the Bible. I take a lot of good stuff out of it. And, um, but songs and, 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 and music are always where I always felt there was the re the most the most useful information for me that I understood that helped me figure out how to be a person in the world, and it was you know uh, from from writers from songwriters, and and so I would always put together songs that said something, and so yeah, I was always putting together playlists of songs for girls and and. Um, it, it, pulling together a group of songs that say, listen, this is what I like. This, this is a way of saying, this is defines my soul, you know, and, 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 and you give your playlist, you, you make playlists for only the people that want to know you, that, that you want to know you the best, you know, and it's always, it's always, when I mean, somebody gives you a playlist too, it's funny. It's like, you're always surprised, like, Oh, I wonder what, what they're telling me about themselves and all this stuff. And they're just potent. They're, they're like love letters. They're wonderful. They're, they're, they're expressions. You just, I'm curating these songs, you know, these little curations of songs that, that, that speak to you. That's a real, and it takes a long time to, to do it right. I spent a lot of time. When you describe that feeling, oftentimes when I talk to songwriters, that's how they describe writing a song that, you know, art helps them process heavy emotions and anger and what's going on in their life and sadness. And for those of us that don't write songs, a lot of times making a playlist can mm -hmm. do that as well. So I love that it's sort of like also a, a non-songwriter's way to uh, process those emotions through music. And uh, it, sometimes it's like nothing comes close to that experience or that feeling of, of well, uh, I mean, sharing that music. Yeah, talking about art with your friends, sharing sharing playlists with your friends, talk, you know, or you know, going to a museum or talking about a book with your a podcast or a TV show with your best friend, is part of the art. It is part of the art. The interaction with the art is like our. What I do is like starts in a bedroom, then it ends up on a stage in front of fifty thousand people. Sometimes, you know, if it's good, if it's any good, um, and that interaction, that sharing, the, me talking to you, you playing stuff on the radio and us performing for you is all still, is all continuing the whole organism, the whole system of people connecting through art um, and communicating. So yeah, it's, it's all, it's all part of the art. Yeah. Well, Serpentine Prison, a beautiful piece of art started as an idea of a collection of covers. We appreciate you uh, performing that Bready Swan song. Uh, then you can tell me goodbye. And what's going to happen with the rest of the covers that you recorded? I mean, what other songs did you record and, and, and what will you do with those? Um, they're... Everything I record, all the other covers I, I recorded, I think are either, um, they're, on the, they're on the vinyl deluxe. And I think they are going to come out um, digitally or whatever. So they'll, they'll be added to the algorithms <laughs> soon, I guess. Um, but, um, um, yeah. And I've got a whole bunch of more covers I want to do. I don't know if I'm going to do covers anymore for a while. I, 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 I feel like you go for down a rabbit hole with covers and you get to, and then you, then you kind of want to take everything you learn from those covers and, and go write more songs. Um, but yeah, every time I work on a cover, I just, I feel like I push the walls out a little bit or just expand my palette and just learn, learn how to sing, learn how to learn what melodies, what, how, how melody works. You know, I'm still, I'm still just, 
learning, you know, and, um, and, and that's part of that process, I guess. Um, yeah, but they're all, they're all available or will be soon. Yeah. Well, that's great. Well, we can't wait to see what you learn and share with us next. I'm talking with Matt Berninger, the new album, Serpentine Prison. Thank you so much for your time, Matt. It's been great chatting with you. Thanks for having me. Yeah. And thanks for that beautiful new record. Thank you. Thank you.